And along with the Women's Commission, we are proud partners in the Her Story series. Um, this series has been seven years. We have invited women from across the campus in various leadership roles to share their story with you. So for the students attending today, we're here to add value and connection to your academic experience. Today's program is help to help you connect with what is learned in the classroom with your out-of-classroom experiences. Specifically, we are focusing on the learning outcomes of communication, learning the importance of networking, and self-awareness that will help you identify skills that can be used in building a successful personal and career path. The format for the Her Stories is more casual and we're encouraging you to ask questions of Natalia and if you brought your lunch I also want to encourage that you are welcome to eat that today. Um, on, you were handed the pink evaluation forms. If you would just take a minute and fill out maybe everything except the questions about the program then at the end you can quickly fill that out and hand it in. I would appreciate that. And I just wanted to take this moment before I introduce our speaker to let you know of, of upcoming programs and some that are happening this week. We have another Her Story on Wednesday, November 16th. That will be Professor Danielle DeMuth. And that will be, again, from 12 to 1 p.m. back in this room. So that's November 16th. This month is Sexual Assault, Dating, and Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And the Clothesline Project is going on. If you would like to participate in making a work uh, t-shirt that is part of the display. Um, we have the material down in the Women's Center and I encourage you to stop by during our office hours which we're open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and that's going on this week. And then tomorrow noon on our downtown campus at 12.30 is the silent witness program and we remember the women and children that have died in the past year as a result of domestic and dating violence so please join us with that a couple of others I won't go through all the programs we have a women's and politics series um, it's called ready and running that's November 10th the flyers are in the middle of your table so please take any of those flyers and then it is the 10th anniversary anniversary of the Women's Center. So we have a speaker series this year. Um, last week was our first um, speaker for the series and our next one will be Wednesday, October 19th. And again, those flyers are in the middle of your table. So feel free to please take those along with you today. On to our speaker today, um, Professor Natalia Gomez was born in um, Balboa, Spain. She came to the United States in 1988 as an international student after studying two years at the university, and I'm going to say it wrong, it's, okay. Upon completion at Western Michigan University, she decided to stay in Kalamazoo and she said she believed it was the fault of the wonderful teacher she had and more importantly the fact she met her husband-to-be, Rob, during her time there. She holds a BA in English and Spanish at Western from Western. She holds a master's in Spanish from Arizona State University and she has her PhD in Latin American literature with a minor in Latin American studies from Indiana University. When speaking about her classes, Professor Gomez said, one of the feelings I most enjoy about teaching is the fact that some students gain a sense of accomplishment when learning. I bring to my classes my own experiences in this country and the difficulties I went through to obtain my education. I share with them a sense of dedication, search for knowledge, as well as an open mind to different cultures, which I believe are keys to success. So please join me in welcoming Professor Gomez. Well, thank you so much. Um, 
first of all, uh, can you hear me? I'm <laughs> short. <laughs> I don't think I can grow. <laughs> so, I would like to give a special thank you to Marlene Kowalski, Joan Wasner, that uh, Daronda, Scott Jones, and all the staff at Women's Center. Each of you makes a remarkable effort to empower our students at Grand Valley State University and the young minds of our community. For this and all you do, I am grateful. My thanks also to this audience for taking time for your already busy schedules to show your support for this important Women's Center event. Being here with all of you is a privilege and an honor for me. And I want to thank you um, also, Sarah Matthew, which is a colleague of mine, and my mother-in-law, uh, Susie Mulligan, who helped me with the final draft of this short story that I'm going to tell you. My life is a patchwork quilt made of many stories of the people who have influenced and continue influencing my life. There are two women, however, who are particularly important to me, Julia Arribalzaga and Raquel Linares. Julia was a survivor of the Spanish Civil War. Raquel was a child during the years after that war. Both were the victims of domestic violence and neither had the means or opportunity to pursue an education. Raquel Linares did attain her high school diploma when she was 40 years old and her bachelor's degree at the age of 60. Both women taught me about sacrifice, justice, and compassion. They also encouraged me to continue my studies at a time in Spain history with women who were brought up in traditional households were expected to be solely housewives. These two women and my students, past, present, and future, are, my, are the reason for, my reason for being here with you today. And they are central to a short story that I'm currently writing. I dedicated, I'm dedicating my story to them as my story is and always will be their story as well. Let me continue by sharing a few fragments of their story with you. The old woman's hands had always fascinated Anna. They were rough, strong, and warm. The kind of warm that comes from the inside. These hands had scrabbled thousands of floors and had washed countless baskets of a stranger's clothing in the river. These hands had lived a lot. Although Julia seldom spoke of the hard, hardship of her younger days, she sometimes remarked, oh yes, the, spa, the past is still hurts. Now sitting beside her, Anna recalls the phone call she received from Spain just a few days ago. Anna, how are you? Is it cold in Indiana? Do you still wear the coat I made for you? Well, yes, it's thanks to your coat that I can keep warm, all bundled up in my wonderful coat. Yes, it's cold here, and the snow is up to my knees. I'm actually just fine, but I'm not sure how much longer I can take this Indiana winter. What's going on in there? I can tell from your voice that you are sad. Oh, Anna, dear, Julia is sleeping away so quickly. They say she will be gone in a few days, or perhaps in only a few hours. Can you take a plane back to Spain? Three days later, Anna took one of Julia's hands in her own, as she had done so many times. The familiar strength and comforting warmth were gone. 
People who knew her said that she could no longer hear them, was unable to recognize anyone, and that she was trapped in her own faraway thoughts. Anna did not want to believe it and did not believe it. Julia looked at her vaguely now. However, perhaps the others were right and Julia was beyond anybody's reach. She squished and struck Julia's hand softly again and again in a communicating, I'm sorry, in a communication they could both understand. As she struck the hand, Julia's eyes met hers and held them in a brief but steady gaze. Anna held the hand tighter and tough of how much and thought of how much she wanted to tell her. As she moved closer to Julia's cheek, Anna could whisper only two words, then seal them with a long kiss. That was her last memory of Julia. Now back at the computer, she tries to concrete on her sec I'm sorry, to concentrate on her second novel, a project that she has been working on for nearly three years. Before beginning the book, she had been meticulously recording moments from her past, so she could portray her life through the characters who will populate her story. As she wrote about Julia, she studied the movement of her own hands. Oh, how she missed Julia. She thought about another period in her life and smiled to herself, taking time to look at her notes. September 4th, 1984. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like any of my classes. Mario lifted up my dress at recess. Eduardo gave me a rose and the teacher moved my desk next to hers. Now everybody's facing me and they are staring at me. The teacher makes me sing in a funny sounding language and everybody makes fun of me. I'm the only girl in the entire second grade and I don't like it. It was difficult for Anna to understand why her mother insisted that she go to school, while her father, on the contrary, said she could stay at home if she wanted. In that battle between her parents, her mom, and them normally winning, Anna went back to her notes and continued writing. She felt now that she needed to write about Alicia, a woman that she adored. Alicia was excited. I have just signed up for the GED program at the high school. Can you believe it? What are you thinking? Where are you going to study at your age? What are all those kids going to think of the older student in the class? Do whatever you want, but I don't understand what you plan to do with a high school diploma at your age. It was not the first time that Jose did not support Alicia's decisions. Jose had the uncanny ability to always say the wrong thing. Jose and Alicia had been together for so long that she would simply nod and not respond. Silence was perhaps her most valuable weapon. She kept her mouth shut but took action she had learned that only with action could she one day be able to respond to his verbal abuse. She took the school books out of her bag. She could smell almost every page as she carefully covered them with yesterday's newspaper. She felt doubts, shame, and above all, fear of the unknown. She had lived with fear all her life, and it was a constant part of her vocabulary. Be careful, or you are going to fall. Be careful out there on the streets. Be careful, come right home. 
and don't look at the soldiers in the eyes. Alicia passed her fears down to Anna. It was that fear that overwhelmed Anna and prevent her from continuing her novel. She didn't feel comfortable writing her second novel. It was a project that Anna had been working on for years. She was her own hardest critic and felt a mixture of apprehension and insecurity because she had never officially taken a creative writing class. The first time that she finally dared to go to a creative workshop, she left more confused than when she arrived. She attended the workshop because her literary teacher had left a flyer in her locker at school. Anna felt that this gesture made her special, so she carried with her three diaries that she had written as a child, and finally she will learn how to write her own story. She arrived to the workshop half an hour early. She was so excited that she hadn't paid attention to the clock, and now she observed that little by little the other students were arriving. Suddenly she felt threatened and out of place. All the students were at least 12 years older than her. In that moment, a tall, grumpy-looking old man interrupted Anna's thoughts and entered the room. Poetic? We all know about poetic, he shouted. Anna could not understand that the, what the teacher meant, and she nervously raised her hand. Teacher, do you mean poetry? That question brought all eyes to her, and some students had a slight smirk on their faces. This reaction to her question caused her to bury three diaries for 20 years. Now those diaries are some of the notes for this portion of my short story that I have read to you today. A few months ago, I was questioned by a female colleague, she asked me how I become to be a part of her story series. She asked me how I was chosen and why I was my leadership and what was my leadership experience. I was surprised to realize that we as women are still questioned about our own positions in life by even our own by even our own gender. So in reaching the meaning of the word leadership, I realized that I do have diff different hats in a leadership position today. One very special to me is my role as a teacher. Every time I step in my classroom, I am a leader for my students, and I need to act accordingly. I must be a leader who asks them not only to work to their fullest, but to make sure that our class discussion helps them think critically and globally outside the walls of the classroom. I ask my students not to be mere spectators, but to take action in their communities, not only action in social issues, but also in the other issues that affect their communities. I ask my students to take chances and to look for opportunities to go abroad and reflect on their experiences to better understand the current events in the world. Last but not least, I ask my students to never stop learning, to be open to differences so they can be leaders in every sense of the word. Yes, I am in, in a leadership position. I always remind my students that teaching and learning does not stop in the classroom, but continues in every aspect of your life. Since 2002, I have had the privilege of working as a board member of Migrant Legal Aid. 
Migrant Legal Aid is a nonprofit organization that provides quality legal services to indigenous migrant and seasonal farm workers and their families, regardless of immigration status. This is an organization that has enriched me enormously, not only as a person, but also as an educator. I have participated in diverse outreach programs with this organization, but the one that I'm most proud of and I continue to work with is a tutor tutoring program to the migrant kids in the fields. This is a program where Grand Valley State University students tutor kids in math, science, and language. I started this talk saying that I felt privileged, and I do. I feel honored because a student nominated me to be here today in front of you. As a teacher, being recognized by your student is the best treasure you can ever receive. All my students have had an influence on my career. I owe them a lot of learning and a continuing effort to help them empower their own lives. I want them to never give up, but to always try to enrich the lives of the powerless and to give voice to the voiceless. I'm also privileged to do what I'm, I, am, I do, and I'm passionate about teaching and writing. First as a student teaching assistant at Indiana University, then as a visiting instructor at New College in Florida, and currently as an associate professor at Grand Valley State University. Grand Valley State University has allowed me to find my perfect niche. I have been able to meet during my 16 years of teaching hundreds of students who have carried with them, I like to think, a lot from my teaching and from my advising. As someone who is herself a first generation college student, I do understand the pressures of the unknown, the fears of thinking that you may not succeed, and consequently you may not be ready to meet the challenges. My mother was 40 when she got her high school degree. But more than knowledge, she taught me something very valuable. My mother used to tell me, and I quote in Spanish, tu puedes hija, translation, you can do it. And I suppose these simple words, but very powerful statement, is what still guides my life. The difference now is that I don't say only to myself, I can do it. But I said to others, you can do it too. I would like my students to understand that getting to where I am today may not have been an easy road, but it was not impossible. And it will not be impossible for them too. However, that is not what I thought when I went to school. I had some language learning difficulties before entering high school. So completing high school seemed to some teachers out of my reach. My mother, however, was beyond, and I quote in Spanish, cabezota, translation, stubborn. Basque people are famous for their stubbornness, and I can say that. <laughs> my students can say that. <laughs> and therefore, she never gave up on me. So here I am today. The difficulties I have learning my first language, Spanish, kindle in me as a big desire to succeed, and with motivation and hard work, I was determined to overcome any obstacles in my life. Little did I know that I would not only end up teaching, but also writing. I try to convey my students to never let other people make them believe that they are not able to accomplish their goals. They should always try their best, and then only time will be their own critic. Life is full of obstacles, however. Contrary to the negative perception, obstacles are the essence of life's beauty. I believe in the possible, 
and hope my students will share that belief. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> Uh, this is an informal type of program, so we want you to feel free if you have some questions of Professor Gomez um, to please ask her. Thank you again for coming. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I'll, okay. I'll catch you. Sure. How is it? that you went to the university in Spain mm -hmm. and then you came over to the United States. Mm -hmm. Was there someone that encouraged you to do no. that? No. that I, um, There was a scholarship available and at the time I was, I think I was 21. I was doing my, I was starting my third year at the University of Deusto doing uh, English literature. And I was sitting with 200 people in a class and I love writing, and I thought, what am I doing here? I'm wasting my time. I mean, I can't talk about what I like the most, which is writing and books. Um, so there was this scholarship, and I always dream about the United States because um, one of the things that I do is I, I write poetry. And I love um, one of my dear uh, poets, which is Lorca. Uh, study at Columbia University. So I have this dream of, of being in Columbia University one day. So I thought, I, I need to go to the United States. So I applied for the run and I got it. And I came to Western, not Columbia, but Western Michigan. But I'm so glad I did because I love the program, I love my teachers, and I just got a, a wonderful um, opportunity and that was great. I mean it was the best the best thing I ever done, one of the best things. I done a lot of things that I proud of but happy about. But that one was one of them and I was very scared because I was the youngest in my home. And you know studying it wasn't something that I was the first to go to university. So my mom was extremely encouraged, but my father was like, you're wasting your time, where are you going to do that? And creative writing, who cares? <laughs> so anyway, um, I only wanted to try for a year, but then I met my wonderful husband, and I fall in love. Woo! <laughs> I'm still in love, so here I am, after 20 years. So, so yeah, that's how he came. And, um, to my surprise, when I finished my bachelor's, I applied, because I still have the dream to go to Colombia. So I applied for Colombia and I got it. But the problem is that I didn't have means to go. But I still have the letter, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's great, yeah. So that's, it was pushing two dreams, one creative writing, but I was a dancer. I, w I danced for until I was 20, I was a ballet. Uh, classical ballet dancer. And I took a course uh, in Spain. Uh, there was another grant and I took a course and there was a, this dancer from New York, don't tell me the name, I don't remember, I was so crazy. Because he said, I want to take you to New York. Like, what? Doing jazz? I want to do jazz, yes! But my parents say no, because that was too crazy of a life. So I didn't end up being a dancer, Although I still dance, you know, I love dancing. But I ended doing something that I never thought I was going to do, and I love it. So I'm happy. Thanks for the question. Thank you. So yes, studying abroad, apart from meeting your future husband sometimes, <laughs> is a wonderful experience. I have gained so much for being in this country. And a month, no, what is it? Oh, August 17, I became a citizen after 20 years. Thank you. <laughs> and that was a great feeling. That was a great feeling. So, thanks. Do you have some advice to, uh, oftentimes I hear of students that maybe, whose families don't quite understand mm -hmm. the college mm -hmm. track that hasn't been their track, mm -hmm. and then the life they have maybe on a college campus, mm -hmm. where other students may not always know or have experienced mm -hmm. you know, a family that mm -hmm. couldn't or wouldn't be as supportive. 
Yeah, I, you know, I was very lucky because I did have one support, which was my mom. I mean, she was just, she, it was all the time. You have to do it. You have to do it. And I think because I was so much on my own world and I read so much and I, I wanted to get out uh, because I was in a situation in which I knew I was not going anywhere. I wanted to explore, and I'm glad I did it. I mean, going to college was the best thing I ever done, and you know, and then continue going. It just gave me, it gave me all the power that it made me feel powerful. You know, that I could do something, that one day I can change. Uh, some things, and I think I, you know, I, I do have some. Uh, I have done some things. Not only I want to think uh, with the students, but also in the community, and I still doing it. Uh, so it was the best decision I ever done. And you know, if I could, I will still go to college. <laughs> and actually, I look into going to law school a month a month ago because I want to go back. But my husband said, I don't think so. Because <laughs> we have two twins, four and a half. I said, just wait a little bit more. <laughs> and he's right. I mean, it's not the time right now, but I would like to go back, yes. Um, I miss it. I miss it very much. And uh, so, you know, it's just, I keep reading. I keep taking workshops. Um, I think it's the best experience, and if I can convey something to you, um, continue. It's, it gives you so much. It opens so many doors, and it gives you the strength that sometimes people want to take off from you. You know, so yeah. Um, you said that you faced some learning difficulties mm -hmm. in your school, and how did you overcome that? I'm this, I have disabilities. I still do. <laughs> but I don't tell that my students, of course, okay? Now they know some of them. But, um, so it was very difficult because I switched letters all the time. I, I couldn't speak until I was three. Um, and it was interesting because um, uh, someone told my mom, you need to take it to the doctor. You need to take it to the doctor because the only thing that I could say was water and mom, that was it. Um, bread, I think. But one day, I, be, I was three, and all of a sudden, I said, um, in my birthday, actually, I said to a woman, thank you so much for the basket. I love chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I guess it was in my brain. But uh, later on, I, did have, uh, I do have disabilities. So it was very difficult for me to come up with that and, uh, and you know, learn strategies to uh, first hide it because I was ashamed. Uh, but then I said, no, enough of this, you know, this is what, who I am and I'm just going to uh, be a, read a lot, which is what I did. I read a lot and uh, I write a lot and that helped me. And also learning another language, it gave me even more power to overcome it, you know. Um, so I still do, you know, especially when I become, um, when I'm very nervous, and I write on the board, and I, blah, I write something, and I go, whoa, I was too close to the board, Bling, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I have learned, and probably it's familiar to you, Kelsey, that sentence. You know, I have learned strategies so, of not saying, well, this is, you know, I can't, I don't spell right, or I didn't do this, but you, you overcome, and I think once you do that, you feel more comfortable on yourself. I do, you know, I don't care if I have that. That's part of who I am. I think I know we are on the way, so that's why I moved this way. <laughs> Any questions? I love being with you guys here. Could I ask okay. one question? Yes, sure. If you had mentioned it was two women very close mm -hmm. that had experienced domestic violence mm -hmm. in their lives. And that's Coming up, this is a short story actually that I'm writing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is a month that at Grand Valley we very much raise that awareness. There are things to students can become um, part of being the solution. Yeah. Um, do you have any reflections, thought on you know the experiences that your family went through? Um, I think one of the things that helped us is that uh, we were extremely close family, my mom and my sister and I. And one of the things that um, 
I myself saw it when I was seven the first time. And then it was for years. But um, and I think uh, one of the things that helped my mom particularly, my mother, my grandmother didn't talk about it, but my mother did, is that we talk about it. You know, as hard as it was, we talk about it. And I asked 